In the vast world of renewable energy, few machines have earned as much respect as the Francis turbine. For well over a century, it has stood as one of the most reliable and efficient ways to turn the raw power of moving water into electricity. Tucked away deep inside massive hydroelectric dams, this engineering marvel works quietly, unseen by most of the people who benefit from its power. Its story is one of brilliant design, relentless refinement, and global impact. To understand it, we must step inside the dam, follow the path of water, and explore how every piece of this remarkable turbine comes together to power cities, industries, and homes, the Francis Turbine is the beating heart of countless hydroelectric plants. From small regional stations to some of the largest powerhouses on Earth. Without it, the clean energy revolution of the 20th century would have looked very different. But to appreciate just how it works, and why it remains so dominant in the modern age, we need to start with its origins, a time when water power was just beginning to evolve from simple water wheels into precision machines. The story begins in the mid-1800s with James B. Francis, an English-born civil engineer who made his career in the United States. In the industrial town of Lowell, Massachusetts, water was the lifeblood of manufacturing. Textile mills relied on the flow of the Merrimack River, and any improvement in water power technology could mean more production and more profit. At the time, water wheels and early turbines existed, but they were far from perfect. Efficiency was often poor, output fluctuated with changes in water flow, and designs lacked the scientific precision needed for consistent performance. Francis approached the problem with both engineering insight and a scientist's rigor. Through systematic experiments, he tested turbine shapes, blade angles, and flow patterns. He didn't simply build by trial and error, he measured, calculated, and refined. His eventual design combined radial and axial water flow, adjustable guide vanes, and a carefully shaped runner that could handle a wide range of water heads without losing efficiency. This combination of inward radial flow and downward axial discharge created a balanced, stable turbine that delivered high performance in conditions where other designs struggled. From its invention, the Francis turbine proved to be adaptable. It worked efficiently in medium head applications, typically between 10 and 600 meters of water drop. This made it suitable for locations all over the world, mountain rivers, deep reservoirs, and moderate dam sites. Over time, the design was scaled up for massive powerhouses and refined for smaller plants alike. Today, roughly 60% of the world's installed hydropower capacity uses Francis turbines, Stepping inside a hydroelectric dam that houses a Francis turbine is like entering a cathedral of engineering. The first thing you would notice is the massive spiral casing, often made of thick steel, that wraps around the runner. Water from the dam's penstock enters this casing at high pressure. The spiral shape ensures that the pressure and flow are distributed evenly around the entire circumference of the runner. Uneven flow could create vibrations, inefficiency, or even damage. From the spiral casing, water passes through stay vanes, fixed blades that help guide it smoothly toward the wicket gates. These wicket gates are movable, adjustable guide vanes that control both the amount and the angle of water entering the runner. When the gates open wide, maximum flow is allowed through, increasing power output. When they close partially, flow decreases, reducing generation. The gates can react in seconds, allowing the turbine to respond quickly to changes in electricity demand. Once past the gates, the water enters the runner itself, the heart of the turbine. In a Francis turbine, the runner's blades are curved in a way that captures both the pressure and velocity of the water. This is what makes it a reaction turbine. As the water flows radially inward through the blades, it loses pressure and imparts force to the runner. Then, as it turns downward, it leaves the runner axially, continuing to push as it exits. The combination of these forces produces smooth, powerful rotation. The runner is connected to a vertical shaft, which rises through the center of the turbine to connect with the generator above. In the generator, magnets and coils convert this mechanical energy into electrical energy. The result is clean, renewable electricity ready to be sent to the grid, but the process doesn't end when the water leaves the runner. There's still energy to be recovered. And that's where the draft tube comes in. The draft tube is a gradually widening passage that slows down the exiting water and converts its remaining kinetic energy into pressure. 
This not only improves efficiency but also allows the turbine to sit above the tailwater level while still operating under full pressure. Without the draft tube, a significant portion of the water's energy would be lost. Francis turbines are known for their exceptional efficiency, often exceeding 90%. Achieving this requires precision engineering. Every surface that touches water is carefully shaped and polished to reduce turbulence. The wicket gates are designed to adjust with minimal leakage. Bearings and seals are built to withstand years of operation under immense forces. Large turbines, like those in the Baiheton Dam in China, can have runners more than 10 meters in diameter, weighing hundreds of tons. Each one is custom-built for its specific site, taking into account the water head, flow rate, and other conditions. Computer simulations using computational fluid dynamics help engineers fine-tune the blade shape before manufacturing begins. Even after installation, turbines are monitored constantly for vibration, temperature changes, and efficiency performance. Despite their strengths, Francis turbines face challenges. One of the most significant is cavitation, the formation of vapor bubbles when pressure in parts of the turbine drops too low. When these bubbles collapse, they create shockwaves that pit and erode the metal surfaces. Over time, this can reduce efficiency and cause costly damage. Engineers prevent cavitation through careful design, maintaining appropriate operating ranges, and using strong, erosion-resistant materials. Another challenge is sediment erosion. In rivers carrying large amounts of silt or sand, particles can strike the blades at high speed, gradually wearing them down. Special coatings or stainless steel surfaces are often used to resist this damage. Francis turbines have also adapted to the modern need for flexibility. In an electrical grid with increasing amounts of variable renewable energy, like wind and solar, hydropower plants are valued for their ability to ramp output up or down quickly. The adjustable wicket gates make this possible, allowing operators to fine-tune output in real time. The scale of these turbines and the plants that house them can be staggering. Take the Three Gorges Dam in China the largest power station in the world. While it uses a mix of turbine types, its massive Francis units each produce hundreds of megawatts. The Baiheton Dam, completed in 2021, features some of the most powerful Francis turbines ever built. 000 megawatts per unit. These giants turn slowly, often at just 75 revolutions per minute, yet the power they generate is enough to supply millions of homes. Inside these massive units, the same principles discovered by James B. Francis still apply. Water enters at high pressure, is guided smoothly by stay vanes and wicket gates, flows through carefully curved blades, and exits through a draft tube, all while transferring nearly all its energy to the generator. It's a process so refined that, despite the scale, losses are minimal, maintenance is critical for such valuable equipment. During planned shutdowns, teams inspect the runner blades for signs of wear, check seals and bearings, and ensure that wicket gates move freely. Advanced plants use sensors to monitor the turbine continuously, detecting any abnormal vibrations or temperature rises before they become serious problems. Francis turbines have also been part of environmental innovation. Engineers work to design intakes and flow controls that reduce harm to fish and aquatic life. In some cases, special flow patterns are created to mimic natural river conditions downstream, helping maintain ecosystems while still generating power. From a small-scale plant in a mountain valley to the largest hydroelectric dams in the world, the Francis turbine remains a cornerstone of renewable energy. It has proven itself across climates, continents, and generations, adapting to new challenges while keeping its core principles intact. Conclusion: The Francis turbine's journey from the experiments of James B. Francis in the 1840s to the colossal machines of the 21st century is a story of engineering excellence. It stands as a symbol of human ingenuity, the ability to harness nature's forces in a way that is both powerful and sustainable. Inside the concrete walls of hydroelectric dams, these turbines spin day and night, turning the silent push of water into the lifeblood of modern civilization. As the world moves toward a future where clean energy must play the leading role, the Francis turbine will continue to be at the forefront. Its efficiency, reliability, and adaptability ensure that it will remain vital, even as new technologies emerge. For now, and for decades to come, the steady hum of a Francis turbine will mean lights in our homes, power in our industries, and a reminder that sometimes the best solutions are those that stand the test of time.